Well, now, you've, uh, I said a minute ago, you're, you're basically an American. You were brought up in America. Uh, how is it for an American to spend 26 years in Europe? I mean, do you lose contact with your, with your country? Do you become more European? Do you see things differently? Uh, one sees things differently, certainly. Um, I keep contact, uh, naturally, with my family and my friends. I make a great effort to. Um, my friends are very important to me, and uh, I go often to the United States, and I'm very eager to, uh, you know, to keep up with what goes on there. And I think it's very, it's fairly easy for most Europeans to do. I don't think Americans keep up with what's happening in Europe very much. When I'm in America, it's very hard to find any news about what's happening in Europe. But, of course, once my children were born here, I began to feel uh, at home. And uh, this is where my family is now. And uh, so, in many ways, I feel European, but certainly my education is American, and I'm still uh, very much American. What, what do you see as the basic differences between the way Europeans see things and Americans see things? Do you, do you see a difference? Well, of course, yes, there is a difference, but it's hard to, it would be hard to describe, I think, because the world is changing so much and so rapidly, and uh, what would have been true of a European way of thinking 10 or 20 years ago certainly isn't true today. I don't know, it would depend on which subject and which... Uh, well, which as, a way of, as a way of life, uh, the European way of life uh, is well, different than the different American way of life. Well, that's different in Northern Europe than in Southern Europe. Uh, we perhaps have more in common here with other Mediterranean countries than we would with some of the Northern European countries. And the Mediterranean countries seem to hold on to uh, older traditions longer and uh, don't accept change very easily. Don't you think also that there are uh, different views of the values of, for example, time and... Uh, oh, certainly. And the relationship with nature and... Well, I think people here, particularly in Monaco and on the coast here, live each day as it comes a little bit more and are not quite in such a hurry and such a rush. Um, Was it difficult for you to, I mean, you'd had a very public life in America, in the motion picture industry. Of course, you've had a public life here, but it's a totally different life. Very different. When well, I was uh, acting, of course, I loved acting. I loved uh, working in the theater and pictures. I didn't particularly like being a movie star, if you know what I mean. There's a big difference. I love working at my craft. I didn't like having to have a public, uh, the, the, the public appearance of being a movie star. Um, although even in Hollywood, my private life was pretty much my own. When I married, my private life became public and I really had no privacy at all. And that was a, a, an adjustment to make. Have you resented the invasion of your private life? Uh, do you feel uh, the press has been unfair about it? Well, in certain instances, yes, definitely. Uh, although, as far as my husband and I are concerned, uh, we are public figures and we have to expect that. Where my children are concerned, uh, they resent it very much and they don't feel they are public figures and that they don't have to be at their age and particularly their growing up years have been made very very difficult because of the uh, press and the so-called paparazzi who follow them uh, relentlessly uh, and it's not always their fault they're just trying to make a living the best way they can and but it's the editors who encourage them to do this and uh, uh, buy the pictures. And this has been very, very difficult and has caused a great deal of anguish to me and to my children. And they make up things. They've made up romances. They've made up, they love to say my children have flunked out of school when they haven't. In fact, they've all been very good students. Uh, they love to say, um, well, if you know, you believe some of the things, I would have had at least 52 babies by now. For many years, I was always expecting a baby, according to the press, or that my husband and I are constantly being divorced, which also is not the case. Um, but uh, my children have had to... Stephanie, for two years, went to gymnastic class in the, the trunk of the automobile, just so that they wouldn't follow her, wouldn't see her. 
And then, uh, and you know, there have been uh, instances where Carolyn used to come home in tears from a tennis lesson. She said, well, I couldn't have the lesson because the photographers were there and I didn't want to take it with them taking pictures, you know, and it was just this continual. And they have felt, uh, particularly Carolyn has felt very much, I suppose, like uh, a, a hunted animal, you know, with the, the, the hounds after her. And it's, um, you know, they really go in for the kill sometimes. And it's, it's unfortunate. Uh, you know, I've always felt that uh, I'm always willing to give the other fellow the benefit of the doubt. And I certainly respect people who have a job to do. But when it comes to uh, some papers kind of feel that we're fictitious characters and that gives them the right to make up any kind of story they want. And this is, you know, one is helpless to in defense of that. And if a child is very young, I find it very, uh, well, outrageous really that uh, when Stephanie was 16, they had her engaged to someone she never even set eyes on. Not engaged, but I mean saying sneaking out to sea or being, uh, you know, putting innuendos there that made it sound something very disagreeable. And uh, that's it's been hard for them. Growing up in the spotlight is not easy, and it's, it's been tough. I don't think any mother can really see the future. I think with all my children, I hope that they'll be able to... Uh, uh, bring out their, their qualities as, as individuals. You've been talking about the children, which leads me to, uh, to another question, and that is, you were brought up in America, you were brought up in Philadelphia, in an Irish Catholic family, and now you've brought up three children in a totally different atmosphere here in, uh, in Europe. Uh, what would you say, first of all, are the basic differences between the way you yourself were brought up and the way you brought up your own children? Well, I think I've tried to instill a lot of the, a lot of my own upbringing into uh, to their life, into because uh, we only know from our own experience. And uh, I've tried to adapt what I thought would be useful to them. I think uh, I've tried to uh, expose them to as many things as possible, as many uh, to teach them as many skills as possible, to expose them to as many points of view as possible. To, uh, we've often had them with us, with our friends. Uh, to, uh, you know, they haven't been, I find that with a lot of uh, my American friends, the children are sort of pushed off to be with the children. We've always tried to include the children with us and our friends and have all ages together, which I think is, uh, is more beneficial and more fun for everyone. Uh, maybe our children don't always think it <laughs> that way, but I think, uh, I think on the whole, they're, they're very fond of our friends and they've learned a lot from being around older people. Uh, also here in Monte Carlo, we have a very, at certain times of year, it's a very international meeting point. And we've had perhaps around our table as many nationalities as, as guests uh, often. And so, our children have been exposed to a lot. Um, naturally, being in Europe, there uh, the emphasis on languages is uh, is more important. Our children all speak uh, English and French uh, perfectly. Uh, two of them speak German, uh, two Spanish, and uh, two of them Italian. So that um, you know, they uh, this I think is an important part of their their culture. Also, uh, what can I say, the difference? Well, there have been so many differences in American uh, education since I was educated there, too. I mean, uh, so it's hard to compare the changes uh, in American schools from what it was 20 years ago as now is very different. And even here in Europe, I noticed there's a big difference from the time that uh, Caroline was in school as to her sister Stephanie, and there's eight years difference. So, um, you know, as mothers and educators we have to adapt and change all the time well, well i mean uh, I, I have a son uh, 16 so he, he what he's about the age of uh, stephanie, stephanie yeah. just about to do his uh, baccalaureate and uh, i must say that when he gets together with his american friends or goes to america they seem to have no meeting point uh, that uh, 
the European education has provided a much richer cultural, linguistic, and so on background than American. Perhaps, Do you find that true? Perhaps uh, intellectually uh, they're more advanced, but they're less uh, self-reliant, I think. Uh, American kids are um, taught to be more self-reliant and uh, more on their own earlier and given perhaps a little more responsibility. Uh, of course, I rather deplore the lack of discipline everywhere today. We sort of tend to think that knowledge is a substitute for discipline, and it never will be. Uh, our children were brought up with a certain amount of discipline and found it quite natural. Uh, I think it, my, our son, when he went to college in the States, had suffered kind of a cultural shock because he wasn't prepared for the sort of imposed liberties that one finds on an American campus. But um, he has been to America very often. He spent many summers there. And uh, of course, they have cousins the same age and they've visited back and forth. So, you know, they have contacts with America and feel uh, uh, very much at ease there. Uh, did you and, and Prince Rainier kind of uh, divide up the responsibilities and bring, did you have any definite plan and in dividing the responsibilities and bring up the children? Well, we've, you know, we discuss things uh, all the time, and uh, I think uh, it, most of the discipline falls to the mother, but the threat of a father's no carries a lot of weight. And then I think when children are in their teenage years, uh, the presence of father is very important and very necessary. Was your father a disciplinarian? Uh, uh, not too much. I'm uh, afraid my mother had the that mother job. mother had the job. <laughs> It has fallen to me quite a bit as well. And so you've inherited that job from your yes. mother. One of the uh, one of the basic differences between when you grew up and, uh, and 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 your children growing up today is uh, the impact of television on young people's lives. I mean, you barely had any television in your life. How, how, was, is that true? Well, of course, television has invaded the household, hasn't it? I mean, it seems to have replaced everything in our lives today. Uh, but. Of course, when I was growing up, we did have a bit of television because my father uh, was very friendly with some uh, had friends at Philco, and they were just making their first experiments, and they would put sets, play sets in various families here and there, and uh, they had programs three times a week, I remember, and they would send us uh, an announcement of the programs of the next week, and we would have to check out uh, what the you know, the reception, how the reception was, the quality of the program, this, 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 which my brother, sisters and I did very religiously. We thought that was a great responsibility and great fun. So uh, we were aware of television quite early. And uh, then, of course, I worked in television as, a, as an actress. I was in, worked in live television in the uh, early 50s. And that was quite a challenge and, and very exciting. It was. Uh, it was sort of the pioneer days of, of television, and uh, it really was wonderful to be part of it. And how is television different now? I mean, you said it invaded the home. Well, you know, when you have a, a, there's a film to see or a book to read, it's a matter of choice. You choose to, to go to see that film, you buy that book. Uh, the television programming is just pushed into your house, and there it is. And uh, I know, uh, the people in charge say, oh, well, it's up to the families to uh, choose what their children should see. Uh, I have tried, when the children were in school, saying, well, you don't watch television as long as you have homework, and during the week we won't watch television. Well, then, of course, father comes home and he turns on the set, and the children think, what are you going to do? <laughs> and uh, there's no way of, of keeping children from watching television. And I found it uh, very, very difficult. Uh, I tried to use it as a means of punishment, that marks are bad, no television. Or... But, of course, it's a wonderful means of education, but it also has, uh, it has it, its bad points. It can be very destructive. And I know a teacher here in Monaco who has said to me, oh, I dread Monday recreation because these kids are acting out everything they've seen on television. And it's pretty rough and violent. So, um, you know, it's, it is uh, one of the problems of our time. But I always think that because something is possible doesn't mean it's always desirable. Did and you have we're going through that 
excuse me, this no. uh, sort of experience now with television, because it's possible, it should be on all the time and everyone should be watching everything. And it's become a babysitter. It's, um, so for children, it's, it can be very dangerous. And then children become brain soaked by it and numbed. And I've read some statistics not too long ago saying that an American child on reaching the age 18 has seen 18,000 murders and 350,000 commercials. Now that's kind of scary, isn't it? But on the other hand, television has been a great uh, companion to people alone, to uh, people in hospitals, people in remote areas. It's, uh, it's been wonderful. But uh, Do you have any precise uh, examples of, of influences or bad influences that may have had on your own children at some point? Uh, something that happened? That uh, yes, I remember uh, Caroline watching television as a child and being quite upset and quite hysterical over seeing something and it was all I could do to try to tell her that it was make-believe but television goes from newsreels or actualities into uh, fiction, into movies. Uh, how does a small child know the difference? How do they know what's really happening and what isn't happening? Maybe you know, that's because real life is like that today. What, I mean, as we look around the world, it's hard to tell the difference between reality and fiction. Don't you think that is? I mean, it's tougher and tougher, for example, for novelists to write novels that have some new factor in them because what's going on in the, in the news often it overpowers them. Well, that's true. Definitely. Do you think, uh, I mean, one, one of the problems, obviously, is to what extent does the, does the family have a responsibility, or the parents have a responsibility to, to monitor what their children watch on television? Well, I think as far as possible, they certainly should, and it's a parent's duty to do that, but uh, there are more and more mothers who are working, uh, and there are families who have more than one television set. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult, and if parents are out, how do you know what your ch child's watching? You can't tell. And they're different, uh, particularly in America, the different time zones. What might be on late in the East is on early enough in the West for children to see. They haven't gone to bed yet. Um, I know the movies that I've forbidden my children to see in a, in a theater, but then they're shown on television. <laughs> you know, so. Let me go back to, uh, you, you said something interesting about uh, bilingualism. I think it's true that in Europe, uh, many, many more people are bilingual than they are in the United mm -hmm. States. Some people find it difficult to teach a child two languages at the same time. Did you have a particular method in doing it's that? It's very difficult, and there are dangers to it. Uh, I received a letter from uh, a teacher when Caroline was first born, and she gave me some very good advice. And she said, a child can learn any number of languages as long as they associate a language with a person. And if one person tries to teach two languages to a child, it is it's lost. It's, uh, it's very bad. They confuse them. Uh, a child can have a problem with stuttering. Uh, and then, of course, I found that the, the dangers in, with bringing children up in two languages is that one often has um, the, uh, there's the danger of having, uh, of, of missing things in both languages, you know, of, uh, so it's, it's hard to keep up, and then cho our children, of course, went to school in French, their friends were French, and so then their English suffered a great deal, and I would try to then uh, surround them with English-speaking people or have English-speaking friends here. Uh, I have always spoken English with them, but they speak French with each other and French with their father. So it makes, I mean, everyday life a little confusing at times. <laughs> but, um, well, how did you learn French? Uh, well, I learned French in school. I could read it and write it a bit when I was married, but of course I couldn't speak it or understand conversational French. And, uh, well, I just sort of learned from, by osmosis, I suppose. And then I would read a lot in French. And I, I found that reading plays in French helped me for, for dialogue. I mean, you know, because it's one thing reading prose, and it, but it's not the way people speak. So I read uh, I tried to read plays as much as possible. I'd like to turn to you now and talk about you. Uh, what, what do you see as your future at this point? You're, you're still a very young woman. You've got a fascinating past. Uh, do you have any plans for the future? Are you thinking of doing things? Oh, uh, well, I've always got lots of plans and projects, and 
that's the trouble. I get involved in too many things, and, and uh, there's never enough time for them all. But, um, no, well, my youngest child now has just graduated from high school, and uh, so this is another kind of turning point in uh, our lives. Uh, I'm very involved in, as you know, uh, many of the charitable and uh, cultural aspects of the principality and many projects here. Uh, I also have been involved in things outside of the uh, principality, uh, such as the uh, Irish American uh, Cultural Institute, the uh, La Leche League that promotes uh, breastfeeding women. And uh, I've been giving some poetry readings in the last few years, and uh, I have plans to continue that. Uh, what, what, what got you in the back of the poetry reading? Because that's one of the more interesting well, activities you do now. I was uh, asked to participate in a program of American poetry for the, uh, in 1976 for the uh, bicentennial. And there was a, a program that was going to be done, first of all, it was supposed to be done, uh, was uh, initiated through the uh, cultural attaché at the embassy in, in London. And then we gave the program at the Edinburgh Festival. And uh, then after that, I was asked to join in others at uh, Stratford, and uh, uh, mainly in England. And then we'd done two tours in the United States at several of the universities. And uh, so it's, it's been very enjoyable. It doesn't take too much time, and it's, uh, it's something that I like uh, doing very much. Some people f seem to feel that uh, your, uh, your poetry readings are... Uh kind of an advanced step to maybe going back to acting or going to the movies. Is that right? I don't know. There's been a lot of, uh, you know, I'm very flattered that people think that I could still uh, be in pictures. This is, you know, 26 years later. It's a long time. And, uh, but, you know, acting is a very time-consuming profession. And uh, to do it well, one has to do it completely. And it's a, it's a full-time job. But with your children uh, now pretty much growing up and about to leave the nest, you would have more time if you really did want to try that again. I suppose it would, uh, it would mean a complete reorganization of my life, and uh, it would be uh, a very difficult decision to make. Well, you're not saying that if somebody came along with that offer that you couldn't refuse, that you wouldn't say yes. <laughs> I have always tried to avoid saying never or always yeah, never. in my life. <laughs> in a way, you've had two separate lives. I mean, you had your life as an actress, and now you've had your life here in Monaco. To what extent did your first life affect your second life? Well, I think well, certainly uh, my training as an actress has helped me enormously in uh, what I've had to do here. One's whole education is called upon constantly, you know. Uh, as one goes through life, there's so many uh, things that uh, I'm grateful that I've I have studied, even though I never thought that it would ever come in handy, or uh, certainly training uh, for the theater, and the discipline, I suppose, that uh, one learns in the theater and in, in pictures has been uh, extremely helpful to me. But you maintain your interest in the theater through all this period of time. Oh, certainly, mm -hmm. certainly. I've, I'm interested in, in all creative activity, you know. And what about your links with people with whom you, you, you went through your career? I mean, have you maintained your links with people that directed mm -hmm. you in pictures or acted in pictures with you? Yes, definitely. Uh, with many. particular mm -hmm. relationships that have survived these years? Oh, yes. Well, uh, there, there are quite a few uh, uh, friends from, from Hollywood. There are many who live here in Europe now that I see and uh, others that uh, come and visit. Uh, as you've watched the evolution of the, of the world, and you have not only watched it, but you've traveled a lot in it over the last 25 years, do you have any thoughts on, on the evolution of social mores or standards of life over the last 25 years? Yes. I, of course, we've seen so much change, haven't we? Uh, I, I regret uh, seeing the, the breakdown of the, the family in many countries, and I think this is one of the big tragedies of our of our age uh, because it is the nucleus of, of society also 
perhaps uh, that things are more liberal, more open, freer today. In a way, one good side of it that I see is that people are able to discuss more openly things that used to be hidden with great pains in the past. And uh, I think, well, growing up has never been easy, has it? But I think perhaps it's easier today because perhaps parents can speak more freely with their children on certain subjects which they never dared speak about before. And uh, after all, we bringing up our children, we want to help them as much as we can and, and try to guide them. And uh, uh, of course, uh, my uh, children think that I grew up in the Stone Age, as uh, you know, all parents did. But still, we have been able to uh, have a conversation, a dialogue, and a contact, and discuss most of the problems and, and uh, most of the, the things that affect society today. One of, the, one of the major things that's happened in the last 25 years has been uh, the feminist movement. Has that touched you in any way or interested you in any way? Uh, certainly it has. Uh, it hasn't touched me very much because I always felt uh, when I went away to school and uh, started working, I felt very free and liberated already. I was uh, earning my own living uh, before I was 19. Uh, I didn't feel, uh, you know, I didn't feel as though I was being, uh, suffering. Uh, perhaps as a, as a teenager, when I was growing up, I thought, well, you know, it would have been nicer to have been a boy than a girl, but uh, I got over that very quickly. I've seen a lot of nice things come out of the, uh, the liberation uh, movement. I've seen a lot of unhappiness, too. Uh, very often, I think, um, the price for independence and freedom is often solitude and loneliness. Uh, since the uh, women's liberation has been in effect, the percentage of alcoholism amongst women has gone up enormously. Uh, this is not a very good sign, is it? I do think women should have the uh, right to work and choose a profession, whatever they would like to do. And, and uh, there are so many professions now open to women that they do extremely well. Uh, I myself was um, on a board of directors for five years, and I was the, the first uh, woman to be on this board. And it was a very interesting experience, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Did you feel like a token woman on this board? Yes, I did, but uh, that was all right. <laughs> I mean, do, you see, do, you, do you see a difference between the European approach to feminism and the American approach? Is it more militant in America than it is here? Well, probably it's talked about more in America, yes. Well, if you had stayed in America, would you have been a supporter of the ERA? Would that have been a cause that would have interested you? Well, I don't think, uh, I think the results are interesting. I don't think I would have used those means, perhaps. Have you reflected much on, on the political developments in America? Have you had any thoughts on what has happened to your country in the, in the 25 years you've lived abroad? Oh, yes, I follow it uh, with much interest. And uh, I can't say that uh, I feel Are you distressed? equipped or, uh, or informed enough to make any great statements about it. But I certainly uh, have followed all of the problems and the, the anguish through the years with, uh, with tremendous sentiment and, and the feeling, certainly. I mean, do you, sitting here in Europe, I mean, do you think America is as much respected as it was 25 years ago, or, le or is it uh, equally as well respected? I think respected? it did lose its uh, respect there for a number of years, which it is gaining back again. What, were, what was your vision of why it lost that uh, respect? Well, I think uh, rather weak leadership. When America was uh, out in front and the strongest nation in the world, uh, they didn't hold the reins as they should have, I, I don't think. And you believe that there's now a comeback, though? Well, I think so. I think, you know, as we know, very often after the war, Americans wanted to be liked, wanted to please. Well, it's very hard to be a leader and in that position and please everyone. You just can't.
you know, we talked at the beginning about you having lived as an American in Europe for 25 years. How does an American maintain his roots? Don't you have a feeling that, that we get cut off from our countries? I would like to see boundaries and frontiers less, less important. Um, I feel at home in many places. And I think it's the, the reason for that is about caring about people. And people are basically the same everywhere. Uh, they are different because of their habits, their traditions, the languages, the food they eat. But uh, the basic needs and wants of people are the same. Um, I don't think I respect nations and people's feelings for their, their, uh, their love of their country. That's very important. Uh, but I do feel that today we, we must emphasize uh, opening up borders and reaching out and, uh, and not worrying who is uh, you know, how many medals did this country get in the games? How many did that one get? That is of little importance. I think uh, in something like the Olympic Games or international sports, it is uh, the individual that counts or the team that counts. And um, I would like to see more of an emphasis on that. You're talking now like a transnational. Do you consider yourself Perhaps. a transnational? Uh, or yes. a transcultural? Well, wherever I've gone in my travels, I've hated to be taken for a tourist. I, I'm delighted if I'm in a strange city and people come up and ask me directions. <laughs> that, I, that they think that I might belong there, and I like that. No, you're hitting a subject which, which fascinates me, because I really believe that uh, a lot of what you say is right, that uh, we ought to try to bring our young people up to be more transcultural and more transnational and well i think a lot of that is different uh, certainly with american youth today they're traveling so much more i mean i never had the opportunities to travel when i was 18 as kids today have uh, i think this is wonderful but when you talked about continuity and roots when we were talking some time ago about uh, about royalty uh, mm -hmm. isn't also the attachment to a home country a part of uh, continuity and roots well, as well? Well, it is, and I don't see why one can't go without the other. What, the strength of America is the melting pot, perhaps, let's say, and all young, young first-generation Americans uh, didn't want to be associated with their European countries. They wanted to be first American, didn't they? And uh, this was the strength of America. Earlier we were talking about, uh, and you had something sometimes a little harsh things to say about the press and I must say the kind of press you were talking about I agree with you uh, but I wonder if we can look at the entire press based on uh, this kind of small segment of the press that goes yeah, in the direction well, of, of sensation. It, it, uh, it certainly must be a problem for you and for other serious journalists to uh, you know have to deal with those who are, are less serious and less conscientious. Um, you know, uh, I just, uh, I've had feelings of resentment because we have a press office. I'm not that closed off in an ivory tower. People can pick up the phone and get a secretary or even get me on the phone. I've often asked editors, uh, why don't you check? Uh, call me. I'll be happy to tell you if it's true or not true. Uh, I don't mind if, uh, what people want to say. I mean, everyone's entitled to his own opinion. If a writer or editor want to say, well, I think uh, Prince and Princess of Monaco are terrible, or this, this, uh, we don't like Monaco, that's one thing. But to uh, put words in our mouths that are not true, or to quote us on things that we have never said, then I resent that. And uh, unfortunately, there's very little one can do about it. One of the ironies, it seems to me, is that uh, the United States is the country where for example, political leaders' private lives are the more scrutinized than they are in Europe. And oh, absolutely. And I think this is a great problem for the United States. Uh, what, I mean, and uh, certainly if my husband was going into political life in the United States, I would feel like many wives do and say, don't do it. Who needs it? Who wants to be scrutinized to that extent? Uh, you, to, uh, to give up all sense of privacy, all kind, all sense of home life, family life. For the children, what a burden that is. My father was in politics for 10 years when I was growing up, and I ended up by hating politics. 
Our Just phones were tapped. We had, uh, we were followed. Uh, you know, this was very disagreeable. Uh, it just you, you you put your finger on one of the great dilemmas of, uh, of democracy, and that is how much are the are the people entitled to know about the backgrounds of the people that they're called upon to vote for, and what are they uh, not entitled to know about them? Well, how do how does one separate that? Uh, there's always uh, the right to know. Yes. Uh, the news that's fit to print, but uh, then there's the, the morbid curiosity, which, and a lot of uh, the press want to be the first with a scoop, with a bit of news, so they anticipate an event, uh, to the point sometimes where they will anticipate it to, uh, instead of just anticipate, they make it up. And then, you know, they don't want to be left with egg on their face, I understand that, they want to be right there with the news uh, before it happens. But as a result uh, of this kind of freedom of the press, there, there's no freedom from it for the victims. There's no way we can get back. Uh, and there's no way that we can say that isn't true. Thomas Jefferson once said that if he had to have a country uh, without the press, or a country in which the press was controlled, or a country without the press, that he would prefer a country without the press. Well, I think the press is important. A point of view is important. I think the more newspapers there are, the better, because it represents different points of view. It gives the public a chance to, to read uh, many uh, sides of a, a story and, and to make a decision. I'm certainly uh, not for censorship. I'm against that. But I do believe that individuals must take a certain moral responsibility. It's up to the editors to take a moral responsibility. Uh, they make up captions for pictures. Of course, I'm talking about a certain type of press that invades our lives. Sure. I'm not talking about the political press or the international press. But, but uh, uh, pictures will be taken and an editor sitting in his uh, little uh, ivory tower somewhere will write the captions that he thinks might be amusing or I fitting or might sell. Uh, you know. Uh, how do you explain the fact that more people want to read the National Enquirer than want to read the New York Times? Well, I mean, that, that, that's really, I mean, that's is, the bottom uh, line of what we're talking about. Well, this is unfortunate. But, uh, and I know myself, years ago, I was asked to speak at the uh, anniversary of the YWCA. Uh, it was held in Philadelphia. They were celebrated the 100 years of the YWCA in America. And uh, we were four women invited to uh, speak on woman's role in contemporary society. One was Margaret Mead, the other Pauline Fredericks, Mrs. Martin Luther King, and myself. Uh, there were very few papers who carried anything about this. Uh, the New York Times never mentioned this. Yet the New York Times was very eager to write about my birthday party that was happening the next week and what I was going to wear, and what who was going to be there, and the frivolous, silly thing. So even thing. the New York Times has succumbed to this. Very frivolous at times, I'm afraid. Do you bring it on yourselves at all? I mean, uh, well, I'm not talking about politicians, because they, I mean, they, they know what they're getting into when they run for public office, but in certain people, isn't it a price you have to pay for celebrity? I suppose it is, and I'm willing to pay it up to a certain extent. Uh, I, I don't believe, I don't like being misquoted. I don't like being uh, told, oh, Grace feels this way about this, or she resents that, or she... They don't know how I feel about it. How dare they assume my feelings? That I don't like. I know that it's much too early in your life to ask you this question, but at some point somebody's going to ask it to you. How are you, how are you going to want to be remembered? Uh... Well, I suppose I think mostly in terms of my children and their children, how they will remember me. Uh, I would like to be remembered as uh, trying to uh, do my job well, of being understanding and kind. Are there any things about your career that you'd like to have remembered? Uh, they will be remembered anyway. Well, I don't know. I don't feel as though I achieved enough in my career to uh, to stand out more than many other people. Uh, I was very lucky in my career, and I loved it. And uh, but I don't think I uh, 
was accomplished enough as an actor to be remembered for that particularly. Uh, no, I'd like to be remembered as a, as a decent human being if and you, a caring one. If you had another life, what would you like to do with that life? Have you ever thought of that? Oh, well, there are lots of things. <laughs> I've been asked that. I think you know, if I have to be reincarnated, I think I'd like to come back as one of my dogs. They have a very happy, nice life <laughs> and a very easy one. <laughs>